Welcome to the Be Still, Be Aware series, where nothing is off limits. I'm your host, Claire Ford. Let's talk. Hi there. Thanks for joining us for the Be Still, Be Aware series. I am joined by special guest Mary Kustas, but many of you will know her as Effie, the consummate performer, the amazing Greek goddess, and a comedian. But we are going to get very serious today when we chat with Effie, or Mary, and we are going to be hearing about her journey through IVF and how to face it when you have to go over and over and over and over again with those negative news that you are not pregnant. What to do when your life turns into loss and how to find moments of joy and love in moments of deep grief and those parts of your life that really do shape who you are today and forever. So please join us on this beautiful journey and this story as we listen and hear from Mary Kustis. Let's talk. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this series is recorded and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Mary, I'm super, super thankful that, you know, we're chatting and I know that our conversations have started earlier on, you know, over the past years. And I think, you know, many would already know your story, but some may not. So I would really like it if we could go back, you know, right back if we can to, you know, starting your pregnancy journey. And I suppose even the journey through IVF as well, because I think that that's a lot that people can um, learn from what you have been through and the persistence and, you know, learning to advocate for yourself and all the things that you asked for, you just didn't give up. Your tenacity is incredible and that drive um, to be able to forge that family. And look, it's not without trials and tribulations. So I'm, I'm wanting to learn a bit more about that if you're happy to. Yeah, to absolutely. Um, well, you know, my, my story was, I suppose, a typical one of, of the current times. Uh, I had a career I was passionate about and a life I was passionate about. I just didn't have a man I was passionate about. Uh, not that I thought that I was lacking in anything. Um, I had boys, but not quite men. And I wanted to marry a man, not a boy. So uh, I finally met my now husband um, when I was 38, 39. Um, and a year after, I mean, that was, that was a beautiful story and a great connection that was immediate um, as opposed to the long-term relationships I'd had in the past, which were never marriage material. And I don't know why I wasted my time. And this will be a running theme about timing because, uh, you know, sometimes we take too long to get to an answer, uh, even though we know what the problem is. And we'll get to that with the fertility issue uh, later on. So then uh, a year and one day after we... Our first date, George proposed, and three months after that we got married. But uh, he proposed in Greece and we'd had uh, us, my 40th birthday with all my best friends in Santorini and we started trying to conceive from, from that point on. Uh, perhaps even a little earlier, in, in honesty, maybe we'd been sort of unprotected for, you know, six months before then, but we weren't timing it. We weren't trying to get the timing right. We were just, you know, it was random. So nothing had happened and then we got back, we got married. Um, so that was September. So we got married in January. By about March, I'm thinking, well, it's, it's been a while, nothing's happened. We've been trying a lot more, um, you know, consciously and all of that. Maybe I need to go and get a test. So I went and had a laparoscopy and that revealed that I had blocked tubes. So then um, we couldn't, as I, as I like to say, we couldn't go through the tunnel, so we had to go over the bridge. <laughs> and uh, living in Sydney, that, you know, people know that dilemma every day. So um, we had to go to IVF. And then uh, an another way I like to put it is my second marriage began, and that began with IVF. So that was, and I don't mean to rush through the, the moment when I found out I couldn't conceive naturally and, and get to the IVF you know, decision. That was a quick decision, but it was a, it was a very intense, heartbreaking um, period for me. I was, mm -hmm. for the first time in my life, outside of my father's death, that I felt, and that, and even around my father's death, I didn't feel depressed. I was just grieving. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but I think it was the first time I'd actually felt a deep, a deep um, low depression mm-hmm. um, because I felt completely helpless. And, uh, and I was shocked, completely shocked. It was something I'd never entertained. I was always sort of very healthy and, um, you know, I was always great with food and exercise and I had a very active life and, you know, very positive and all of that. So I'd never really entertained the idea that I couldn't have children naturally. So anyway, we, sta- we started with IVF and we chose a, a doctor who was female. She'd had her own twins. So I figured maybe she'd had them through IVF, sort of ticked all the sort of superficial boxes. We went in, we, we started uh, our IVF journey. The first negative result was pretty difficult because you honestly, there's a delusion that comes with doing IVF as well as you you tend not to um, entertain the idea that it's not going to happen on the first go. So I was very positive that it would and it didn't and it didn't again and again. Uh, On the third attempt, I found out I was pregnant, um, which was super, you know, thrilling, only to find out at the seven-week scan that the baby with a in the hands of a hideous um, ultrasound operator um, said, oh, that doesn't, well, that's a bit odd. Mm. Well, that's, that shouldn't be happening like that. Wait, wait a minute, let me go and see what's going on here. That's just not, that's not right. It's not. And then said, oh, your baby's reading at five weeks, yet it should be seven, seven and a half. And then I rang my doctors and they said, well, let's hope that in the next week or two there's some growth but in brackets, be prepared. So then that was my first miscarriage. I miscarried. uh, I think I had a week before I went back for my next scan. So that was, if I thought the depression I felt uh, around the finding out that I couldn't have children naturally was one thing, well, then miscarrying was a whole other league as well because then suddenly I was going to be a mother and suddenly now I'd lost that, you know, baby and, um, so I didn't give up, of course. Uh, so then I did in total 15 IVFs uh, in Australia. So I did another 12 after that miscarriage in Australia with no positive result, no pregnancy, nothing. So it was just becoming, you know, like a mountain that was like, you know, sitting on top of my chest. You know, I was just like running and I became very disillusioned with my doctor, my original doctor, because she wasn't trying anything else. She wasn't offering different ways of doing things. I knew just from my own bit of research or other IVF patients that I'd spoken to that there were different protocols that were being used overseas and DHEA and different things and try this and try that. And there was none of that. Let's just try again was the only thing. And I felt like I was on an assembly line. Mm. Um, maybe I left, I can't remember, maybe I left 10 goes in with that doctor and I'd read an article about a a great doctor called Dr. Gavin Sachs and he'd done a lot of research. He's an IVF doctor. He'd done a lot of research on natural killer cells. Mm -hmm. And that, I suppose that's a way of saying great immunity. If you have natural killer cells, it means that you, you know, in my case, because I had an abundance of them, it means that I'm super healthy and I don't get colds and things like that, like my immunity is really strong. But on the negative side of that, when it comes to doing IVF, you have got somebody else's sperm in your body, in the mix, you know, in the dish. And then in, um, and so uh, my body was, you know, probably fighting off those embryos and uh, therefore resulting in a negative result. So I went to him and we did the research and we knew, so he put me on some steroids in order to suppress my immunity, et cetera, but still I was having no luck. Then this beautiful doctor who was forever looking for answers and and a, a result said to me in the kindest fashion ever, I can't watch you do this to yourself again and again. Time is, is passing. You've had so many attempts I need to um, lovingly point you in another direction that might be confronting initially but I think could hold the answer for you. And he said, have you ever considered donor eggs? And maybe in passing just like, you know, just like a, you know, a, a, a waft, someone had said something once 
it, no one had ever, you know, it's one of those dirty secrets that people don't like to talk about because then they, they might be outing themselves. And, and so it was never a conversation I had that I'd really thought about um, deeply. I went, oh, really? Oh, and then it came and went. And my doctor said, you know, I work with these great, uh, this great couple. They do IVF as well, but they specialise in setting people up with donor eggs. It's very hard to come by in Australia. You either need to advertise. It can't be seen to be um, a paid thing. You advertise for some philanthropist that's, like, kind and, and um, would like to help a stranger, or you use an egg of someone you know, or you go to this couple and they have great relationships with five different overseas clinics where you can access donor eggs. I... I I wholeheartedly encourage you to, to make an appointment with these people. I'll um, set you up and let me know if you want me to do that and we're good to go in that direction. So I thought about it and, yes, it was confronting. It felt like I'd failed and all those, you know, key feelings that we all feel. Um, and I, my husband and I, George and I, went and visited the, wine, uh, the Bernsteins and they had a clinic at that point called Fertility East. It's now called Donor Egg Australia. And so we, we met with this couple, the greatest couple, um, really the care factor, because anything I had in the cold experience of my initial doctor and not, you know, not, I, I suppose people um, in IVF, particularly or anything around fertility or anything as confronting as those sorts of issues, use very benign language and they are removed because they don't want to promise anything or evoke feelings that are not reasonable and mathematical. And, and so I'd had this sort of distanced relationship and it wasn't until Dr Gavin Sachs that I got someone that really cared about me, my outcome, not trying to keep me in the system making money for the, the clinic and same with the, the Bernsteins. So we chatted and they told us that their longest and most successful relationship had been with a Greek clinic. And the doctor that owned that clinic in Athens uh, was a Greek Australian like me and he'd gone to Athens and opened up this huge clinic and they have had incredible results. And then we spoke about that. And the other thing, apart from the fact that the doctor was a Greek Australian who I could relate to and the fact that it was in Greece, these are all positives for me, was that um, the donor would be anonymous. And that for me was a big deal. You know, I didn't want to overcomplicate what was already now starting to become a complicated scenario. Some of the other countries like America, you can literally, like you're shopping for something, uh, choose height, hair colour, and that's fine, I get that, because they're trying to, even in Greece, when it's anonymous, try to match you as the mother physically as much. I get that. But then there's other levels that people are interested. Is someone musical? Are they good at basketball? Um, you know, all these mm. other complicated, like, a, like it's a recipe uh, that you're trying to put together. And I had one ingredient, which was the, the Greek DNA, and that made sense for me. And, of course, um, you know, I, I like the fact that the donor was anonymous. Mm. And the other thing that I loved was that I knew that they'd screened that donor for all um, health issues, uh, genetic health issues. And so that's the case with, with every clinic. Um, so I, was, I knew that it, the egg would be as healthy as possible, that it had Greek DNA and that I, I wasn't, inviting an added complication of a relationship or access from that person to me and from me to them. And it wasn't because I'm well known. It was not that. I just didn't want all that psychological complication. So Greece was the word for us. The other thing you've got to do is when you agree to use donor eggs, you have to um, do some... Um, not psychological, but you've got to have a therapy session where you discuss the complications, not only for you and your husband, but also for the child as well. So they talk you through, you know, the feelings you might be feeling, the issues you might need to address, when to address them, you know, with your child, et cetera, et cetera. So the Bernsteins got me physically up to scratch by doing all the testing that the Greek clinic would have to know. 
we went and saw this fantastic um, therapist who specialises in this sort of stuff. That box was ticked. And now we're going to Greece. And I knew once I went to donor eggs, my chances went from 0.0 something to 50%. Mm. But as my beautiful obstetrician said, 50% doesn't mean every second term. It's like, you know, um, you know, rolling the dice or, or, or flipping a coin where it, it, you could flip tails, you know, seven times in a row. So we went there optimistically and I got pregnant on my second attempt. So then that was great. I got back to Australia. I discovered I was, in fact, pregnant with twins. Fantastic. Both child and sibling, both in the one pregnancy. How good is this? That was at the seven-week scan and at the nine-week scan um, it was revealed that, in fact, one of the twins, uh, one of the eggs had split into two. So now uh, what that meant was I was suddenly pregnant with triplets and the two eggs were in the same, the twins, the, you know, there's a single one and then there's uh, the other two um, are now sabotaging each other with twin-to-twin -twin transfusion. So one's taking more. Um, of what it needs from the other and then the other is, and so that was a very complicated situation. So from going, going from being, you know, infertile, I was now abundantly pregnant and I had a big problem on my hands because of my age, because of what the twins were doing to each other in the same sack, because of my hip size, I'm not a big girl, I'm petite, uh, which might look great in jeans, doesn't look great when you're trying to birth three children. Uh, and carry them to, you know, uh, all of those things, um, a very difficult decision had to be made and we consulted five doctors and they all separately without speaking to each other said exactly the same thing, that in order to save the singleton we should reduce the twins, which is a very nice way of saying abort. So now I had a decision to make, or well, we had a decision to make within two weeks. Um, and that was an extremely excruciating decision and it was made. And so at week 11, I went in and we reduced the twins. Um, then I should preface what I'm about to say by saying that I was bleeding throughout that pregnancy a lot, on and off consistently, even prior to the reduction just from the beginning and Doctors will tell you 50% of pregnancies have some bleeding and not to worry and all of that, but we all know that bleeding is, you know, uh, usually related to something negative. So um, we find out on the 19-week scan that we're having a girl, which was thrilling because I wanted a girl, and, and then two weeks later my waters broke. And then I was hospitalised and... Even though my waters broke, I didn't give birth for another two weeks. I was actually in the maternity ward with only 10% amniotic fluid left uh, with my daughter who was fighting for her life and managed for, for, by some miracle to still continue to stay alive for another two weeks. And then on day one of week 23, meanwhile, I've had every doctor come in and explain what uh, I would encounter, should I give birth X week, X, you know, like what what compromises. Um, and then I just knew the morning of week 23, there was no doubt in my mind that that was the day for, for it was, yeah, it was the day that history was going to be written for our family and, and no one could talk me out of it. I had an ultrasound that morning, Stevie, my daughter, was alive my doctor said not to worry. It was just in my imagination. And, you know, about 5 p.m., 6 p.m. that night, I started having what I didn't even know because, I, you know, I hadn't done any birthing classes, but I started having contractions. And then um, George started timing them when he came in at 7. I just felt a pulling, like a pulling feeling, and George timed them and said, no, this is, you know, you're going into labour. And, and the midwife came in, gave me 
a Panadol, called my doctor. My doctor called my grief counsellor, who I'd been seeing every day while I was in hospital for those two weeks. And we went into uh, the birthing suite. Um, VJ, my doctor, said she's alive now. She won't come out alive. She won't make it through the birth canal. She doesn't have the lung capacity. And, um, and so I had to birth a child I knew wouldn't come out alive, and that was very, very traumatic. Um, and yet, um, and yet illuminating and, and beautiful and all these other things as well. And I think when, you know, when you're, when you're truly in the moment, no matter whether it's great or, or tragic, you, well, this is my capacity and I don't think it's just because I'm an actress and I've learned to keep an eye on what's happening in a scene or um, that, you know, there's an always a part of me that's sitting outside and watching. Um, I think it's unfair and perhaps not healthy not to see everything and just to focus on the one thing. And in that room I was surrounded by people that were, as, as I had throughout almost all of my IVF journey, people that were doing everything they could to support me and deliver a positive result for me. Um, but we were sort of, we'd come to the end of this dream and my daughter was delivered, my beautiful midwife who has done incredible work in, in these areas with women like me and families like ours put Stevie on my chest um, she photographed Stevie with me uh, and it's such a weird moment when you're posing with a child that's not alive. Um, but she said all of this, you know, will be comforting to you and it'll be something that'll help you. Um, and, and then, and then, you know, and then the tsunami of grief and sadness and, and or I couldn't believe how beautiful she was. Um, I was totally in love with her. And then I had to go and have my placenta removed because it, it, would, it had adhered so aggressively that it needed to be operated on. And we don't see that part of the movie or where the placenta comes out. And so I was taken to, uh, to the, the proper operating theatre and I, I nearly died there because I'd lost so much blood and, but on the good news, you know, I really wanted my mother to meet my daughter and George, my husband, couldn't bring himself to look at her or hold her or come closer to her. And, and I understand everyone has a right to grieve in any way that they can and, and we all live with the way that we choose to, you know, um, deal with something and, and we can't expect two people to deal with something exactly the same way. So, But I, I did whisper to Deb... Um, Deb DeWald, my grief counsellor, I'd love my mum because my mum was outside. I'd love my mum to hold her and see her. And anyway, then um, Deb, when I was in the operating theatre, when VJ was trying to remove my um, placenta, Deb went to my mother and George was there and said, you know, would you like to see Stevie? And, and, and my mum sort of referred to George and just looked at him and George said, I don't think that's a good idea. And, and my mum said, Mary said, um, Deb said to my mum, Mary said, and my mother said she didn't even get to finish the, the sentence because as far as my mother was concerned, if I as the mother, uh, you know, was strong enough to hold my baby, then, then of course she would be too as my mother. And so she did. And, and then, you know, I spent the next 24 hours with my baby the whole next day and then we left and we went home empty-handed. And, um, you know, the neighbourhood knew I was pregnant and, you know, and all of that. And then suddenly, you know, I came back to, to a home um, that was now completely empty. And so from that somehow I did anything I could to sort of get back on my feet and recover. And, um, and, and that was May of 2011 and I went back to Greece for yet more attempts that September. And there were six more attempts there. So now at this point I'm up to, I've done 22 attempts. And Greece means obviously away from my home uh, and often away from my husband. I retired my mother after Stevie's 
birth. Um, she'd seen already too much. She'd been with me on so many of those attempts and, and it was just now my, you know, my thing to do. So I went and I went again and again and again and I was done. By, tw- by, by the 22nd attempt, I was done. I was on my own. I was, it was incredibly difficult just howling into my pillow every night so that I wouldn't make noise for others to be alarmed by and just having to make those calls again to my husband and my mother and say the same thing I'd said so many times. So then something hopeful sort of appeared. Um, Two things happened. My mother said, I want you to go back to that church in Greece on that island that we went to and prayed before you fell pregnant with Stevie. It worked for us then. I want you to go and I want you to pray and I know you can't even stand up right now. Uh, Somehow lift your head up and get on your feet tomorrow morning and catch that four-hour ferry and go to that island. And there's a very beloved church on an island called Tinos, which is next to Mykonos, where it's said to deliver miracles. And then simultaneously, George said, I'm, he was in America, I'm, go, I'm coming back. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch the next flight and come to Athens and we're going to have one more attempt, please, just one more attempt. And um, so the next morning I woke up, I went to that island. Uh, I was met with a beautiful woman who I'd met on my first time to that church and she walked me through everything and then she took me down to where they baptised the children and it was the most beautiful little, um, like it had these uh, curved ceilings and it was only lit by candlelight and uh, it was just black and white um, ancient tiles and this it was just the most beautiful place and 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 I was so overwhelmed by the energy in the room and in that moment I I reached out and I said to God you know mother nature the universe whoever it is that energy you know I can't do this on my own I need something greater than the scientists and the doctors and the nurses and the family and and the alternative you know medicine people that I've used all along I need something greater something I need a miracle and if you can deliver me a healthy baby I promise you I'll come back and christen it here so then we did another attempt oh I did go to an Egyptian guy the following day I thought I'd cover all my bases who um I'd been told about by a very good friend in Athens and uh he told me a couple of things that were pretty uh gobsmacking Uh, about my life there's no way he would know he didn't even know my name my friend just said I'm bringing someone and and it was like pretty incredible and he said can you do me a favor and call me the day before you transfer the egg and um and I will start you know and he loved the timing of it it had something to do with the full moon and whatever and I just I just was just trying to put as much insurance about this around this final attempt as I could And the one other thing I did with my doctor on a medical thing was I said to my doctor, I feel like I've been um, finishing the steroids too early. I rang my doctor here in Australia as well just to get a, you know, would they be doing any damage whatsoever if I was to stay on them for longer? I feel like I need to stay on them at least for the first three months to just you know, any urge for my body to reject because now I had not only George's sperm but I had somebody else's egg. So there were two foreign things in my body. So I don't know, was it the church, was it the Egyptian, was it the steroids, I don't know what it was, but somehow it all came together. George left, went back to America. I was on my own staying at a, a family friend's house and uh, it was, it was um, uh, what's April 1st? Uh, April Fool's Day. And I went to have my blood test. So I remember jumping in a cab and getting across Athens, looking at the Acropolis as I was driving past and thinking suddenly that day everything looked shiny and bright and just so happened that every time I turned around I'd see someone smiling or hugging someone or just nothing but good vibes, these like little scenes. I went to the clinic, they took my blood, 
I begged them to tell me as soon as possible, you know, once they got the result, because some days they'll leave you waiting for hours and hours and hours. Went back to my friend's house. My friend had her friend around who was reading coffee cups. I don't really like Greek coffee, but I'll do anything for a little bit of magical something. I didn't even drink it, but I got her to read my coffee cup. And just as she was reading it, my phone rang and I knew it was a clinic, but I didn't tell either of those women that that's who it was. And I went into the other room and I closed the door and it was the nurse which who was gorgeous with a speech impediment who just happens to be called Dimitra, which is my now daughter's uh, Greek name, and I didn't name her after that nurse. I named her after my um father-in-law who I have a crush on who's Dimitri and uh, Dimitra called and she she started speaking so fast and with a lisp and using a lot of medical language that finally I said to her Dimitra stamata please stop tell me in the most basic language like yes or no is it yes or is it no and she said yes it's yes and it's a strong reading and we have high numbers and this is good and it's a very strong yes so I went back into the room I did oh firstly I tried to ring George I went to message bank it was 1am in America I ring my mother in Melbourne and my mother says this Maya yes Maya she knows what day it is she knows that was the day I was going to get the result I said, yes, and because it was April Fool's Day, she said, are you tricking me? I said, I'm not tricking you. We have a yes, a strong yes, and uh, she said she did this all on her own around her own house, (laughs) Um, and that was it, and that is my story. And, yes, I bled through the pregnancy with Jamie. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was on high alert. Yes, I didn't want to um, tell anyone um, outside of the, you know, the closest because I was worried, because of my history. But I'd written a book as a love letter to Stevie, my daughter who passed, and and the book was about to be released. And it was a memoir centred around three deaths. My dad's, that was a big loss but not a tragedy. My grandmother's death um, at 93, which was the perfect death, in her own home surrounded by everyone she loved, and Stevie's death, which was a tragedy. And so I'd written this memoir, which was, you know, heart-wrenching and, and, but yet still very uplifting somehow. Um, and it was about to be released. And now I'm like, literally it had been printed when I found out I was pregnant with Jamie. So I was going to do the publicity in honor of Stevie and in honor of so many families out there that might not get the happy ending. And, and so I started doing publicity for the book. And the first bit of publicity that came out was in July and it was the Good Weekend magazine in the, in the, um, the papers um, on the Saturday and, it, and I was on the cover and then there was a five-page extract. Um, and I wanted not to be interviewed for my story. I didn't want it to break in that way. I really needed to tell it myself because it was so complicated. Mm. And so... There was five pages of everything that I'd been through up until this point in this incredible um, magazine that it felt like, you know, uh, had triggered this massive response in everyone that weekend. I mean, it was just trending everywhere. And then on the Monday morning, um, 60 Minutes rang. And also Australian Story wanted to do it. But I wanted my story to be seen by as many people as possible and most people that are interested in me sort of don't watch the ABC. They're very much commercial television viewers and so 60 Minutes did the story. And it wasn't until the final day of the shoot that I revealed I was actually pregnant. Mm. And at that point I think I was 22 weeks pregnant with Jamie. And so after this harrowing story that 60 Minutes told, there was just this last bit of joy and hope at the end of it with the pregnancy and revealing that. That is my story. Apart from I have an awesome kid. I knew the minute she was born that I didn't have to worry anymore. The minute I looked at her, I had a message from somewhere saying, you don't need to worry anymore about anything. This one's going to be just fine. 
And as difficult as it was sort of going back to the same birthing suite, the same hospital with the same doctor and my grief counsellor there, but this time to document the happy, you know, photos, um, I got to the other side of it and because of those people and many, many more. And I think, um, thank you for just like literally bearing your soul. I know I didn't interrupt because I really just wanted to, to hear you speak. I think you tell it incredibly eloquently. It's your story. There is so, so much in there and so much grief and pain and you would be forgiven for stopping and for, for not being able to, to move um, forward and continue this journey, this path. But like I said, when we started this, your tenacity is extreme. You know, your determination uh, is next level. I think to never, you know, to look life in the eye and say, I'm still going, despite all of the tragedy. Now, if we go back to, you know, even just going through the IVF journey and the depression that you felt, you know, through that, and then to be, you know, hit with a miscarriage and to, you know, the depression that it would have been the mounting and this, this trauma, this layered levels of trauma that would have been building. Then to go through um, the joy of finding out you're pregnant with twins, then triplets, then to lose two of the babies, then to go through... Yeah, to yeah and to have to, to, to be child, to, to have to. I mean, I could have made the old choice, but I don't know oh. that that outcome would have been. But, but to be told, I'm sorry, but this is the choice you've got to make. And it becomes this, there is so much of a clinical space in there that you just, you know, you can't just feel and be and be present with those feelings without that, you know, the clinical side of things having to inter, inter, integrate with all that, because there is all this um, medicalization that goes on in there with having to go down that path. Everyone just imagines, oh, look, I'm healthy, I'm well, everything's good. I won't be one of those women that struggles to fall pregnant. But you didn't yeah. just struggle to fall pregnant. You also had multiple losses and multiple tries at, at falling pregnant. And then, you know, Stevie is born, but tragically born in this space of grief, but you still found hope. And I think that 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 picture of you saying you do need to look at that whole picture and see those moments of joy and love and being able to connect with with her so beautifully on your chest but then also to say but it was weird it wasn't the way it's meant to be that's not your motherhood and to go back again <laughs> and then persist and you know you have beautiful Jamie here with you and I think but you, you know, you are pe your parenting journey and your story of of grief, and I think it's terrific. Your if ever if no one if people who are listening or watching this haven't read your memoirs, they need to. I think it, you know, those pivotal moments in your life that you talk about and you document in your book, and now it went from three to four of those pivotal moments, and all of them centered around around life, but also you know three of them centered around tragedy and death. I think. Um, it's being able to look at this in a in a, a space of hope and joy, um, whilst being faced with loss. I mean, oh my gosh, your your story is not just harrowing, but a very very difficult. But also, how do you do that whilst being in that public eye? I think you um, you know for those of you for those who are listening and watching who have who have watched your career. You know, you are um, this consummate professional, but a lot of people would know you as this hilarious comedian. Yeah. But you have this deep seriousness to that side of you. And I think that would have been really hard. How do you couple that together? And you did it so beautifully with your, with your um, performance that you recently did. Um, with Effie, I mean, is that is that the way you couple that together? I'm well, sort of that's, that's one way. I mean, my I don't really think about my um, public persona unless I'm performing. Mm. Um, I had that thought this morning. I dropped my daughter off at, at school. I had to race across and do something, and I was just thinking, well, God, I suppose I should have made a bit more of an effort to look better, or you know, like. 
But it just, I choose life above all things, you know. In the game of rock, paper, scissors, I choose life above everything. This is my life. This is my chance at maxing out what I came in with Mm -hmm. and what I'm going to go out with. And I know we, we, you know, there are all these sort of sayings and I don't, uh, I don't know whether I agree with the essence of them, you know, from dust to dust and, and all this, like, you leave with nothing. Um, but we, we don't leave with nothing. We leave with having um, touched, uh, inspired, comforted others just like they have us. And the bit of us lives in those people that we've been able to connect with, you know, Um, So I, you know, I have no interest in having an unhappy life. I have no interest in having an unhealthy life. Um, I will not, I will do everything I can to work through those emotions and get to the better ones. I'll do the work. Um, I, you know, and I used to say this to George and our relationship, you know, throughout that, and I know it's different for many couples, But I was a grown-up when I married George. I was not this fanciful 25-year-old or 22-year-old that thought that, you know, marriage was, you know, some sort of, you know, white dress and then we're going to do this and then we're going to do that. I knew through having been born in a family where my father was dying when I was born that life is important and stuff happens to all of us and it's the only thing that you can do is just anticipate that, it will happen um, without letting it overwhelm you. And when it does happen, to, to, to take in that knowledge that I knew bad things were going to happen not only to everyone but to me as well and to say, well, well I will honour the lesson, I will carry the grief, but I will also go on and be better for it, you know. So I used to say to George all the time, even in my darkest moments, Um, I want you to know that I'm still happy. I'm just incredibly challenged right now, you know, because I wasn't blind to everything else that was good in my life. You know, I have a great marriage. I have great friendships. I have great relationships with my family. They're honest. They're they're close. They're liberating. They're at times challenging. But, you know, they're alive And I will not kill off everything else because something bad happened to me. And it didn't happen. No one deliberately did anything bad to me. I wasn't walking down a street and some random act of violence changed my life and everyone that's close to me. This was people and, you know, that were trying to help my dream come true. So, um, you know, I, I, I took all the, the strong stuff in amongst all the, the, the difficult stuff. I took the fact that my daughter was able to stay alive for two weeks. I took the fact that she was actually beautiful, stunning to look at. I was scared of what I would look at. And yet she looked like some sort of, even my mother said, like some sort of royal African figure with this most beautiful long neck and long arms and cheekbones and very different to Jamie's look, which was just round and juicy and, you know, like I just took, I looked at those faces that were in that room with me in that moment and saw how they felt for me and what they were trying to do for me. So I think, you know, um, you can, as much as I'm a big fan of being present, you've got to be present to everything in that being present, you know. Um, and so, I you know, great I, advice. I don't know. I just yeah, I, I, present I refuse to do it any other way because the cost is mine. Do I really want to lose my, my marriage in this as well? Do I want to see that die? Do I want to see my friendships die? Do I want to see my hope die? You know, um, I knew the minute um, my couple my age with my fertility issues meant there was a huge journey up ahead. I didn't know it was going to be that long. Mm. But we need to get out away from ideals and try to get closer to making the most of the information that we have making decisions we have to live with and and saying it to ourselves in that moment, I am making a decision that I am prepared to live with. 
So I can't continue to blame and put everything, you know, like it's everybody else's. Can I live with this decision or am I willing to? And, and keep that's, that's what adulthood is. Mm-hmm. Adulthood, I believe you're not an adult until you stop blaming everybody else, <laughs> mostly your parents. <laughs> so some people are adults at 18. Some people are never adults mm-hmm. because they are forever blaming, angry. Hold on, I had a picture I had this fantasy. It was supposed to be like this. It didn't turn out like this. Oh, my God, who can I blame? Well, you might want to challenge the fantasy. You might want to say the best relationships are very dimensional, best relationships you grow with, the best relationships you stay close to, et cetera, et cetera. And I could go on, but I'm going to put myself to sleep. <laughs> and I'm, I'm listening to you and just, you know, this is great advice for, for people who are listening and watching because I look at this and think, you know, your life um, is, is probably anything um, but in many ways what your fantasy might have potentially been. Um, and you have been served a very different platter with so much greatness and so many difficulties, but it's your platter and it's your life and the way you live it is your choice. And I think that that's a, a really, really wonderful positive note to have taken from um, pain and heartbreak and to yeah, turn that into you know, like, love, and, love and life. In, you know, uh, this is the way I see it. I am very happy with my lot because... I didn't know the depth of anything. I mean, you know, in regards to this issue, yes, I knew that, you know, and the book, my book starts with saying that death has been my best teacher. And I knew that from the thread of it with my father growing up. Mm. That meant that I maxed out everything. I said everything I needed to say. I did everything I needed to do. I understood that there was an end game. And the end game was, you know, we're turning to, you know, we're going to black now. Mm. Final, the end, it's finished. When you know that, and this is people, the people that have had, you know, that have been given diagnosis that, you know, it changes everything. Yes, it's scary. Yes, we don't want to think about it just like we don't want to think about tax or we don't want to think about cellulite or whatever deep, meaningless other issues that we don't want to think about. Um, when you're conscious of something, that means everything else is brighter and in HD as well, everything. And there are many positives in being bold enough to see the whole picture. Mm. Um, it does take so- courage, doesn't it? I think um, you're, do you think we need to talk about death more openly in life? I think it's the only inevitable I think of everyone. We've got everyone to look at culture to do it better than us. But we don't talk about it. Sorry. We don't talk about it because it's painful and we don't like pain and we don't realise that there's, there's, you know, there's um, pain's a great teacher. Mm. It sounds, you know, it sounds like homework for people and people just, well, just make me happy right now, will you? I don't want to think about that because that's not going to make me happy right now. Yeah, but it also won't let you access true happiness because you're sitting on the surface of something. You're not prepared to go lower, you're only prepared to go higher. And when that low thing hits, which it will for everyone at various points, you know, you're going to be king hit by it mm-hmm. and you and you might never recover from it. You know, um, I don't want to be talking about death every day either, mm-hmm. but I'm not afraid to talk about it. And and I think that, you know, it, it just made for just solid relationships in my life, you know. And I think that, that you clearly live with an emotional deepness that uh, many people ha- that struggle with. You know, these people, like you said, we can, we can only be, some people never, never become an adult. But I think to be able to, to live deeper than, than at surface level allows us to find the happiness that perhaps everybody is searching for. And I think in your journey, um, yours is a, a beautiful, beautiful story and I really appreciate you sharing it. What do you think that... Um, you want what is what is your I mean there's lots of lots of great takeaways and life lessons from your chat today just listening to you share your story has been really purposeful and helpful and I know a lot of people are going to get a lot out of this 
but what is one takeaway that you want to offer somebody that something that you wish you had been told in your um your either your pregnancy journey or your life growing up saying you know I this is something you need to know this is a, a piece of wisdom that you need to leave with everybody oh my What's god there are several. in regards specifically to the IVF mm-hmm. journey because I'm assuming most of your listeners um it's all about trying to have a family and all of that I would say um well, I know certainly through my book and then, um, you know, me outing myself about the donor egg thing and then Sonia Kruger following in my footsteps with her, and I think that's become less taboo now. Mm. But I, I, I wished that the professionals that I was um, giving a lot of money to and a lot of, you know, hope and I was, you know, putting a lot of hope uh, in their hands uh, would have had a lot of those conversations earlier with me. Um, so do we, uh, should we expect just to get that information from those people in, a, in an age where information is the easiest thing to get? Um, I wouldn't mind getting it from them a little bit, just a little prod and saying, okay. Yes, I say. I Definitely. I just think it's sort of a bit of <laughs> responsibility, just like we get told you can, you know, use a condom if you don't want to get an STD. I wouldn't mind, you know, use donor eggs if, you're, if your egg quality is so low. Like, you know, consider this uh, a positive step towards, you know, do we really need to have our DNA in a child that we birth? Is that really the most important thing? Is that a hedonistic way of, mm. yes, okay, I understand it, and like like everyone else, um, I assumed that that was the way to go and that was like, you know, but I wanted to adopt when I was, you know, 10. When I got my head around what adoption was, when I, I, I watched something and, and it was about child adoption and I thought, I want to do that one day. Why wouldn't I do that? I want to take a child that that needs a great home and raise it and bring it into my family and in some ways I've done that. Well, yeah. I have done that. I've done that with a child that's now 28 that's one of the biggest loves of my life, Natalie, who was an only child, was born um, in a house next to us. Um, she didn't have grandparents or anything, and my mother reached out to her family and said, you know, I'll look after your daughter. You don't have to pay me. Um, you know, I, I can't bear watching you put her in your car and taking her to work every day, and don't you have any help? And and they said, no, our parents, you know, we don't have grandparents. My, you know, the mother's parents had died like within 40 days of each other. And my mum said, well, I'll take care of her. Do you trust me? And, and the woman said, yes, well, I know who your daughter is and I've seen you here. And, and that child is now 28 and is one of the greatest loves of my life. Uh, we've adopted her into our family. She still has her own, but she's an only child and she's been, I I feel like saying raised amongst wolves, but (laughs) to a lesser degree amongst Greeks, she's French-Italian. So she's everything. You know, she flew in from New York on the morning of my uh, of of birthing Jamie and she was literally landing at 8.30 and at 10 o'clock. You know, she was one of the first set of hands that held my baby. She slept in the room with me when I was for those two weeks uh, for a heap of those days when I was hoping, you know, that Stevie would stay alive. She slept in my hospital room with me. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what, you know, this is what looking outside the obvious will buy you. Um, I have a beautiful daughter that is so much like me in, in so many ways if that's what I, you know, if that's the dream that I wanted. Oh yeah, I want a mini me. I want a child that's that's just like me. If that was what the intention was, well, then I've had that with donor eggs. Mm. Um, and my daughter knows that I went literally to the ends of the earth uh, to to have her, and went outside of every assumption and comfort that I had in order to to have her. She feels very loved, very wanted. Probably, I would say, you know. Um, more so than plenty of other children mm-hmm. in this world. So, what a gift to grow up to grow up knowing how much you were fought for even before you existed. I and mean, she knows who Stevie well. Thing. She knows about all of that. Um, you know, because Mother's Day often falls on the anniversary of Stevie's death. 
So that's a very bittersweet day for me because, and, and this year Jamie asked me what I wanted for Mother's Day and I said three hours in my bedroom on my own. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what I wanted because I knew what was coming. Yeah. Because, you know, that build-up is a huge one. Um, and the other thing I would say is um, stay proactive in your life. Mm. Like I understand being winded and being disabled by by difficulty um, and you take that time but don't take forever and really stay active in looking for answers, Yeah, looking for solutions. Don't sit in the problem forever. Mm-hmm. There are incredible professionals, friends, family that are giving us morsels of gold, mm. uh, clues from their own journeys and we shouldn't just keep rebelling against great information because the price is ours, mm-hmm. you know. So that's all I would say because I'm you- literally run out of breath. well it's been a pleasure to have you as part of this series and to watch you run out of breath and to 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 listen and be part of your journey with you because you know in your journey you have found a new type of perfect and shared that with us and I am indebted to your um, honesty uh, bravery and um, and complete openness and I think you know there's lots that people will take away from this so I really appreciate it thank you so much Claire, before we go, yes. as a postscript, uh, you know what I think of you. I have met so many people since my story broke in in the field of helping uh, grieving families or wishful families or, um, you know, I, I've met every type of person that is uh, motivated by good and wanting to help others. Um, and I've, I've really enjoyed meeting so many of them, but you are a powerhouse, uh, your relentless pursuit of information, of minimizing, um, negative outcomes of, uh, you know, I've just, you know, you are giving me a run for my money. Uh, seriously, you are not only one of the most attractive humans on on every level. Your relentlessness and your ability to 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 you know fight the good fight for not only for for people you haven't met, but for the legacy that that you've created for yourself is you know breathtaking. So well done. Uh, I hope you meet a million others like you and that there is a groundswell of answers uh, that appear for people who no doubt are already challenged by so many of life's challenges but that can hopefully make their way towards uh, the joy of, of, of having children and, and completing their family. So well done to you. That's amazing. I never know what to say with beautiful. I think you're trying like to say that. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. I really, My really pleasure. appreciate it. And, um, you know, I think just to say that I am, you know, I, I honestly, your your story and your bravery is is something to be reckoned with. And I think, you know, imagine if there was forceful a force like this. I love that. Let's create a groundswell. Let's all of us be part of that. So thank you for being part of that and for, you know, being on this series today just to, to hopefully start that groundswell so we can meet more people like us who want to see change. (laughs) Thank you so much, Mary, for joining us and catch up soon. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today and we look forward to you joining us again next time. Remember, it's never too early to have a conversation, but it really can be too late. If you'd like to know more about Still Aware, the charity that's bringing you this series, head to stillaware.org.